Good evening. Thank you all for participating in tonight's RIP Town Hall, which is being co-hosted by the City of Carlsbad and the Department of Energy and broadcast live by Red Rocket. My name is Dale Janway, and I'm Mayor of Carlsbad, and I appreciate you joining us, either online or in person. This is probably the most important town hall we've held since the first one. Today we're going to discuss the operational readiness review and the final steps necessary to resume emplacement at WIP. Everyone in the community is very excited about seeing WIP resume operations. But of course, more than anything, we wanted to do it right. Thank you to all the men and women who have worked so hard for the last few years to safely restore WIP to being a world-class facility. We also appreciate the regular updates being provided to us. Special guests tonight are Bernadette Granger with Congressman Pierce's office, Diane Ventura with Senator Martin Heinrich's office, and Beverly Allen with Senator Tom Udall's office. We also welcome Will Teeter with the New Mexico Environmental Department. And also sitting right next to him, we have Sergeant Clothier with the state police. Former State Representative John Heaton will serve as our meeting moderator tonight. Crossbad Field Office Todd Schrader will provide an overview. And then Ed Westbrook will talk about the readiness review. Finally, NWP's Phil Bradenbach will present the restart status. We'll take questions at the end of the event, first from everyone present and then online. Finally, as this is likely to be the last town hall under the current administration, we'd like to personally thank Secretary Moniz for recognizing the essential role this project plays to the nation. We wish him the best, and we also look forward to meeting with the new transition team to explain why WIP is so important. Thank you all for being here today, and I'll turn it over to John. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, again, let me welcome everyone for being here tonight and those of you online. I'm John Heaton, and I will moderate the rest of the uh, activities tonight, the, the discussions. Uh, I want to may reiterate a little bit of what the mayor said. Uh, this has been a little bit of a long process to get to the point we are, and a lot of people have worked very, very hard through this whole process. They've, in fact, the workforce has been uh, really amazing to get through all of this in the way they have, and their leadership has been outstanding. They wouldn't have made it without good direction. And uh, I'm an honest man. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit. People don't believe. Excited about the fact that we're very close to the point where uh, we will be open and getting uh, waste back down into the mine and out of the biosphere, if you will, and never have to look at it again, hopefully. So with that, the entire country is completely full of shit. In fact, what are these people talking about? It would throw everything off. The whole system would collapse. He's going to do the... Uh, the beginning part of the program. So thanks, Todd. Yeah. I'll uh, real quick talk about two themes that uh, just came up. Uh, Secretary Moniz's support for the project. He is uh, absolutely a, a, a huge supporter of the project. He gets briefed uh, quite often on it. Uh, big booster. Uh, part of how we got here now is his. Uh, leadership uh, throughout the department and at headquarters and, and helping us get all our uh, headquarters resource aligned. So he is absolutely uh, very anxious, much like we are, to get this place open. Uh, the other point we made was, uh, or John made, is about the workforce. Um, you know, we can sit up here and we can give all these briefings, but the fact is 
the actual work is done by the workforce. And uh, some of the things we've seen lately have been just excellent work. I mean, they're working hard, they're working seven days a week. Um, they're doing an excellent job. Uh, Phil's gonna talk about ground control. And, and some, of the, uh, some of the ideas and how we do work have certainly come from the workforce. And we've seen a tremendous increase in our ground control uh, uh, efficiency because of that. So I'll talk just briefly about uh, three specific areas and uh, uh, Phil and Ed will talk about these in detail. Uh, New Mexico Environment Department was out uh, here last week uh, doing their final inspection of this site. Uh, is it not on? Oh, gotcha. Um, they were out here last week to uh, uh, do their inspections. There were actually two inspections, their annual uh, inspection under RECRA, and then this specifically, uh, there were three administrative orders against the site uh, itself to, uh, controlling our operations. Uh, NMED came in to review those activities also. Uh, they put out a, a press release yesterday, I think it was, my minutes warning, uh, discussing that. They uh, finished up their field observations. They are going over the last of the reports. Uh, we feel um, uh, good about the results and good about the inspection uh, and moving forward. And I would anticipate a report from them in uh, the relative near future. The, uh, and I'll go on to add, during the review, there were um, certainly no uh, showstopper issues that were identified, uh, so it makes us confident uh, moving forward. Um, but, you know, they are, their job is to be the regulator, and, and it was, uh, uh, a very, very thorough review, uh, and they looked at quite a bit. And so I think it gave them a good idea of where we stood. Uh, MSHA, Mine Safety Health Agency, uh, we brought in a team now about, about a month ago uh, to help us with uh, looking at our program. This is not necessarily the uh, site inspectors or the inspectors from the local area. It was from their Pittsburgh office, more their technical readiness area, technical evaluation office. Uh, and they, they looked at our program. Uh, uh, they did make it very clear in a report they issued that uh, uh, we have an exemplary safety record. 30 years of operations without a uh, fatality is extremely uh, strong within the industry. Uh, they had some recommendations for us, and we're taking those quite seriously. We're entering them into our issues tracking systems, corrective action systems, moving forward. But they um, uh, reiterated that our uh, decisions about prohibiting areas and restricting areas were the right decisions to make and that uh, we understood what was happening in the underground. Uh, you know, room four, if you remember, we, uh, a few, few weeks ago, uh, we had a collapse in there in panel seven, and MSHA agreed that you had a collapse and you expected it, and your program combination of visual and uh, instrument readings gave you those operations, or gave you that indication that was happening. Uh, Phil will talk a little bit more about specifics uh, about the report and, and particularly about where we are in ground control. And then the last part is the operational readiness reviews. If you remember our schedules we put up before, uh, there were quite a few activities to get to restart. Uh, the last two were contractor operational readiness review and Department of Energy operational readiness review. We completed the field activities for the Department of Energy's operational readiness review uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago now. Uh, uh, the, we received the final report about that, and we're going through uh, the corrective actions now for all of the findings. Uh, and Ed's going to talk, I think, in detail about what they saw in that. Uh, in addition, the corrective actions from the contractor operational readiness review were completed uh, and validated, and we're moving forward with any last uh, post-start issues associated with that. Uh, we also have some additional activities, such as getting panel seven ready to actually receive waste. Uh, that work was completed this week, and we did a dry run today to actually uh, ensure ourselves the actual waste or simulated waste could go into the actual waste emplacement uh, area within the underground. Um, so uh, what does that all mean? It means we are extremely close. Uh, we've been saying for, I think, six months that our target, our goal is to open in December. Uh, we are still maintaining that as our goal. Uh, if it takes a little bit longer to finish up the last of activities, um, you know, that's okay, because safety comes first, and we're making sure we're doing all our work safe. Um, but uh, things, we are at the end state of the readiness process now. So um, we're feeling, feeling good about where we are on that. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Ed. He'll go through the operational readiness review uh, in detail uh, and some of the findings and, and, 
and their recommendations for us uh, as we move forward. So, Ed Westbrook. Did you want to say something, John? Well, just, just let me, a couple of, I don't know whether Ed will introduce himself very much. He's a rather humble guy, but uh, not really. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but but uh, at any rate, Ed, Ed West, Westbrook has led the operational readiness review team for DOE, and he lives in Denver, and he, you know, when I said, why, why are you in Denver uh, if you're in the, the operational safety arena? And he said, well, it's central to the United States. And if you think about where the DOE facilities are in the United States, a good number of them, other than Savannah River, really, and Oak Ridge are in the West. So most of his work is in the, in the Western part of the, part of the United States. And he's more or less centrally located if you can get out of the Denver airport so to, to get where you, you're trying to go. But at any rate, he's been leading the team, and uh, he uh, leads the safety operations activities. And so uh, we're really pleased to have him here tonight to give his opinions about how things are going and what the situation is there. So, Ed, thank you. Oh, there we go. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, just for a little more background on myself, I've been with the department for a little more than 26 years. And before that, I worked for the Navy for about seven years. And throughout most of my time, I've been doing oversight. Uh, as far as readiness reviews, I've probably done more than anyone else in EM as a team member and as a team lead. Uh, in the last five, six years, I think I've led four. So I have a lot of experience doing this. And with my job, as John alluded to, I travel quite a bit. I get to meet folks from all over the DOE complex. So I, I get to know a lot of people, which gives me a lot of uh, opportunity to figure out who I'd like to include on a team when I do one that's of the magnitude of what we had to do here for the WIP review. Um, what I'm going to talk about this evening is the ORR process in general, so everyone understands operational readiness review and what it means, the scope specifically to what we did for the WIP ORR, what our results were and what our recommendations were, and probably my last objective is to try not to put you all to sleep. The DOE order, and that's what we use as our guiding documents for how we're going to conduct our business, we have 425 tells us what we're going to do for an ORR and when we do it. And if you read all the words on the slides behind me, it talks about hazard categorization of facilities. The WIP facility is a HAZCAT 2 facility. There's no debate about that. That's very clear. And we have standards that drive us to how we make those categorizations. And the ORR process is for startup of new facilities or restart of existing. Clearly, this is a restart of existing facility. And the bullet down the bottom, Readiness reviews provide an independent verification of readiness, and I put in bold independent verification of readiness because that's the big part of it, is making sure that our team was very independent from the WIP site, Carlsbad Field Office. So what is the process? Well, in general, it's very, very structured. You're going to have a plan of action. The plan of action is prepared by line management. In this case, that was the CBFO, Todd's office. They define what we're going to actually look at, what the scope of it is. And they, are, they must maintain themselves within what's in the DOE order, which has 17 core requirements, which tells them exactly what you have to look at. Then they also decide the breadth and depth, how far in detail are we going to go down in each one of those core requirements. And then, most importantly, they get to pick a team leader. They picked me. Thanks, Todd. That was facetious. Uh, as a team lead, once I get that delegation, my job is to put the team together and also develop what we call the implementation plan. We take Todd's plan of action, and we take that and we break it out into what we call criteria and review approach documents, which they're very laborious but very detailed, saying specifically we create objectives and criteria underneath them and how we're going to evaluate each one of these criteria. And they identify what we're going to be looking at as far as demonstrations of, uh, of work to be performed, interviews, what personnel we want to interview, and all the documentation that we need to see and review. Uh, 
once we have all that and get that approved, then we execute the plan when we're told that the contractor's ready. And when we say the contractor's ready, that means they've conducted their own operational readiness review in advance of ours, and they've concluded based on their results that they are ready for us to come in and do the final review. When I come out to do the review, first I have to have my team trained. We didn't bring them out. And just to let everyone know, the scope of this review as far as a time frame of conduct was probably longer than what it looks like because once we got out here and did our site training, we met with our counterparts on both CBFO and NWP. We went over all the documentation. They'd already prepared um, thumb drives for us to use that contain extensive amounts. I think there was like close to a thousand documents already on there, including their procedures, protocols. So at that point, members of my team already were going back to their homes and beginning to look at documents. When we came back out on the 13th of November, we began our, you know, the on-site portion of the review, and we went through those drills, exercises, interviews, and all that, and in the end, we get to prepare the final report, which was issued about a week ago. To sum up and make it seem a little simpler, we, use, we used to use the analogy of the three-legged stool for an ORR. You got people, procedures, and equipment. And I like this particular animation we have up there just because it shows them all connected, because they are. You gotta make sure your people are trained, you gotta make sure they know what they're doing and how to use the equipment, they know how to reference their procedures or you have them in hand, so they all tie together. So when it came down to the WIP review, like I said, 17 core requirements. When you put the plan of action together, you actually have the opportunity to scope some of them out if you've had a timely independent review conducted. You can say, oh, we, can, we don't need to have you look at this. We've already looked at this. Well, they kept all 17 in. The contractor's ORR has 14 applicable to them. We do three additional. We do one to evaluate the adequacy of their review, plus two that are specific just to DOE. The scope also included the AIB, the accident investigation reports uh, from the Zolt Hall truck fire and the radiation event. Uh, we went through all those Johns. Uh, the, there was a brand new DSA that was put in place earlier this year out at the site. Uh, a DSA is a safety analysis saying we analyze every possible thing that can go wrong. Here's the controls we need to have in place to either eliminate or mitigate whatever the consequences of these accidents would be. That was a new system. The new safety management programs were created as part of that. And probably the, the most unique thing was their waste acceptance enhancements, which was unique in the fact that you created now in your safety basis, you, we put requirements on the Carlsbad field office within a safety basis documents within the DOE world that's very unique. And our team also evaluated Carlsbad field office and we looked at headquarters to see how well they're doing their oversight. Focus areas. When I was putting the team together, I went through all these things that, okay, if I want to build my team, what are the most important areas where I got to make sure I have the strongest people I can find? Emergency management, very close to the top of the list, based on what happened with the, uh, the, the fire that was in the mine. Engineering, nuclear safety, as I said, new safety base is very important. Maintenance and work control, another one that ties back to the fire event. Operation, obviously it's an operational readiness review. You're gonna to have to have very strong operations people. And RAD protection. And I put the names up of my team members for a couple reasons. I'm not gonna go through them. But the thing to note is I did draw people from, if you see an EM, that's a headquarters person. The other ones you'll see from Idaho, Office of River Protection, Office of uh, Oak Ridge, which is on the next page, I think. Savannah River. So I did draw people, plus a couple of contractors who I've worked with in the past. So I think this is probably the strongest team I've ever had. So when I was putting the team together and I went to my management, what impressed me most was they told me, anyone you want, you can have. If you're having trouble getting them, let us know. We'll make sure you get the person you want. So this was a really strong team. I just want to emphasize that. I'm going to get to the results. And first I want to talk about a little bit how we've been our results. There's many things we look at, and a lot of things come up like, what's the significance of this particular thing? Is this a, a big deal, a little deal? Well, generally, if we have a non-compliance to a requirement, 
or you fail to implement a control that's required, it's going to be a finding. The same thing is if we look at it and say, well, it's not a, it's not a huge implementation issue, but this could create a safety concern. It's going to be a finding. And we have two bins of findings, pre-start and post-start, and they're pretty self-explanatory. Before you start up, you've got to do a pre-start, you've got to have it closed out. If it's a post-start, after you start up, you can close that one out, but we'd like to see your cap before you start up. And the, different, the factor that makes that determination is its impact on safety. So when I get to the findings, I'll go through and I'll try to explain. You'll look at a lot of words and they might not make sense, so I'll try to explain them in a way that makes some sense. This is how we binned everything when we're all done. You'll see all the functional areas, how we broke everything out, and a number of pre- and post-start findings in each area. Now, you look at it, you'll see the number at the bottom, 21 pre, 15 post, and you say, okay, is that a lot, is that a little? I don't think, I think that's probably about what I would expect for a site that's in, in very good shape, because the way that we bin these out, we don't have any that I consider programmatic. A lot of these are just this, you didn't do this and you should have, but it's in the grand scheme of things, it's not a trend, it's not indicative of a bigger problem because we went and pulled strings on a lot of these things. If we found something wrong, we'd go back and look, are there more of these? First area, emergency management. You look, the, the finding was improvements are needed in WIPs Emergency notification system to support near-term operations and equipment upgrades are needed long-term for liability. The short-term issue was the strobes, there's strobes in the mind that let people know it's time to evacuate. They weren't working. There's also issues with the PA system above ground where there's some dead zones, comp actions were in place, but they weren't effectively implemented in every area we looked at. Because that's right there, notification of an emergency, pre-start finding. The long-term issue is the systems themselves are old and they need to be upgraded. That's why we made that post-start. It's not imminent. The systems can work, but you need to look long-term to get something newer in place. The second pre-start finding had to do with staffing for EMTs in the underground. The requirement is you have to have someone be able to respond in four minutes. If you have all your EMTs in the firehouse above ground, it takes more than four minutes to get down there. That's why, and that was a pre-start because it's a CFR. Code of Federal Regulations. If we see anything that's a CFR, it's going to be a pre-start. The idea is you have to have someone there that can provide CPR if needed. And just to let you know, when we came out and did this, as far as the emergency management portion, we really pushed them on their drills. We came out and observed four different exercises and drills during the course of uh, like a five-month period. Engineering. There was a pre and a post here. The, the pre-start had to do with what we call a PISA, which is a potential inadequacy in the safety analysis. And there the D is for determination. If something happens where you have a question, is my safety analysis adequate? You do a PISA D. That's the first thing you do. Well, after they had the roof fall in room four, panel seven, I guess that was five or six weeks ago, they didn't do a PISA D. Should have done it. And that's why it was a pre-start, because it has to do with the safety analysis. That was the only one in that particular area we found. The second one, the post-start, contrary to the requirements of the DSA, this has to do with the ventilation system. The UVS is underground ventilation system. The IVS is the interim ventilation system. The two combined provide the airflow through the mine. We just found that there's, there's insufficient number of spare parts for the two systems. In addition to that, the IVS was still on temporary power when we were there. That should be moved over to permanent power. Fire protection. Now you look at fire protection, like, wow, three pre-starts, that's a lot. It's like, well, I look at these, and we, we went through this in great detail as a team. What we talked about was, it's similar to like, if you're driving your car and you get a speeding ticket in January. Six months later, you get pulled over for a broken headlight. Six months later, you get a parking ticket. So you got three violations. Does that mean you should lose your license? We didn't think so. Because all these were pretty independent and in, in standalone issues. The first one had to do with the non-waste handling vehicles in the mine. Their DSA, their safety analysis says you have to do an evaluation to see if they need suppression. And if they do, 
You have to do some actions to achieve that. They decided they're going to put uh, automated fire suppression on there, but they weren't a priority. In the interim, it was agreed by everyone that they would use a fire watch with these vehicles, with fire suppression capability on those. The problem was it wasn't well documented and there was nothing approving it from DOE. So it was a paperwork issue, but we still felt because it was safety, pertaining to the safety analysis pre-start. Second one had to do with where you park your vehicles. There's reflectors in the underground. You're trying to get out. You have to see the reflectors. They had vehicles parked in front of reflectors, and that's a life safety code violation, so that became a pre-start. The third one, combustible loading. What we found was some of the documentation for the combustible loading controls in the underground weren't they were conflicting. Some would define, say, a one megawatt uh, combustible load, a three megawatt combustible load. But the spacings weren't consistent between them. Um, we saw violations, well, at least one violation while we were there. We said this needs to be corrected because, you know, one of the things that occurred that cre created where we're at today was a fire. Industrial hygiene, occupational safety. We, make, we put these two together because we had the same individual evaluate both these functional areas. Uh, the first one had to do with the mine rescue team. They did not have an approved procedure for a calibration or cal check for their atmospheric monitoring equipment. When you're going into an area where you don't know what the conditions are, you bring your tools with you. They need to have a procedure for that. They need to make sure that they're documenting their test results. And the other thing was they were using expired cal gas. So obviously that has a safety implication for those emergency responders. Second one, the contractor's procedure for investigating responding to a potentially, an, okay, an IDLH immediately dangerous to life or health atmosphere. That could be oxygen deficient atmosphere. Uh, it was not protective for the employees that were responding. What this had to do was they were allowed to respond without PP. If you called the IH group, said, hey, we have something going on here, maybe an argon bottle opened up. You could respond without PPE. We didn't think that was appropriate. You have to always assume you could be entering an IDLH atmosphere. So once again, that's another documentation issue. Uh, occupational safety, the True Pack, True Pack 2 dock has an unguarded gap between the container and the walking platform. And once again, because it's an OSHA requirement, it became a pre-start. We're talking about a very small gap, but still the OSHA requirements are specific with respect to that. In the management area, one of the things in management we looked at was a startup plan. How are you going to start up these operations? What type of oversight are you going to do? What's your criteria for stepping out of these, uh, you know, these oversight requirements that you've imposed as you go, go through your process and become more proficient with waste emplacement, which you haven't done now in close to three years? And all those details were not in there, so we kind of said we're not going to accept this plan until it has those. So that was a pre-start. The post-start had to do with staffing. Uh, there were several areas. We looked at a bunch of areas where there were potential staffing issues. One of them was actually in the operations group itself where it didn't appear that you could do some of the waste receipt process above ground and do waste emplacement below ground simultaneously because of the limits and the number of operations people. Uh, there was also some limitations with respect to some of the other things like radi radiation control technicians and the way they were broken out with different skill levels. Not everyone's at the same proficiency and that kind of restricted you. I think only eight of 34 were fully qualified. Maintenance and work planning and control. This is a post-start finding and the individual did this, went through many, many work documents and in general, he was satisfied that all the hazards were being identified and they were controlled. But the one consistent thing he found was, I can go through a document and often I'll find a control not in close proximity to where the hazard was identified. Sometimes they were in the precaution section of the document, which isn't where you put them. So that's why this was a post-start, because we didn't find anything that wasn't actually being controlled. It was just they weren't in the right place. Nuclear safety, this first one up here, a great bunch of words, I'm sure no one will understand that, uh, has to do with sprinkler systems in, what, in the waste handling building. 
and this condition was recognized by the contractor that there was a couple of sprinkler heads that were a couple inches out of position and analysis had been done to say it was okay but the documentation that was provided was inadequate they didn't use the technical documentation when they prepared this the justification was crediting all the admin controls on their combustible loading and things like that which is an inappropriate way to disposition that so once again that, that was a, a paperwork issue but it is pertaining to the CFR so it has to be corrected the second one has to do with what we call uh, an unreviewed safety question if you have anything that could affect your safety basis and you're going to change it say your procedure say a test you have to go through what we call the unreviewed safety question process in this particular case we've created this new system for waste where the CBFO has a portion of it the CBFO has to take actions they were not tied into that process and the central characterization program was in the same situation they were not tied into the USQ process operations only one pre start and ops and what this had to do was the procedures can be either management procedures or technical procedures we found uh, several situations where procedures that were clearly technical were labeled as management and the problem we had with that was once you did that you didn't have to have it in your hand to do it and these procedures should be in the individual's hand when they're performing the action uh, the post start the first one procedural noncompliance there was just several of these that we saw and we went through each and every one of them there weren't many I think we saw four total none of them were safety related that's why we made it a post they were all and someone else was always there to correct them on the spot um, but still that's a big issue you always got to follow your procedures con ops matrix that's basically the operation matrix tells you what you're going to do for shift turnover what you're going to do for log keeping how you're going to operate the facility DOE has to approve that the DOE office we could not find any records that they'd actually approve that specific matrix and that was required by a DOE order uh, the last one the con ops implementing procedures this has to do with what we call operator aids a lot of times the work people are doing are, is fairly complex you are allowed to post operator aids to help you do your job but they have to be controlled they have to be tracked they have to be dated they have to have someone's uh, signature on it and we found a handful of these where they weren't done that way QA and if he was happy with this there were no findings in QA uh, in the QA when you talk about QA it's just your typical quality assurance you always think of but also include your contractor assurance system which is how they do their oversight internally and how they track their own issues so they did well there red protection three findings the first one goes back to when we had the rad event back in February of 2014 and red protection personnel did not have to be there around the clock and at that time it took several hours to get a rad person to show up to the site and we were looking at what have you done to make sure this doesn't happen again and we just didn't find a structured program to do that they had a, they had people on a call but it was not a formal process it wasn't proceduralized it wasn't well understood by the people required to implement it so that was a pre-start the second one the second one was multiple deficiencies in rad protection personnel proficiency compliance and level of knowledge of some of the rad techs directly impacting performance these individually were all relatively insignificant it was you look at it and say oh the guy's frisking a little bit too fast he's doing his survey you know his probes too far from the surface well we saw enough of them where we said you know we have a problem because this was identified in your own management self-assessment and your your contractor or you need to take more rigorous steps and rad protection clearly you're serving people out you don't want anyone going home with contamination on them so this became a pre-start the last one had to do with air monitoring that's for people actually working in the underground uh, as we all know parts of the underground now are contamination areas they are airborne radioactivity areas people have to be monitored to make sure that the, the area they're working in we know what the dose rates are and what we saw was where the instrument was placed was too far from where the workers were actually working to give a representative sample so that's the basis of that finding training 
training had one pre-start, operators and RCTs being qualified through a task-based process. What this one here came down to, this wasn't all, this was a subset of the folks went through this task-based qual process where you take anyone's job, you can break it into individual tasks and qualify them through that. And that's fine, they know how to do the tasks, but the qual cards they have that they're supposed to meet had other elements in there, such as taking technical fundamentals, making sure they took chemistry or physics and understood the basis of those, having a system walk down, getting evaluated by their supervisor, taking an exam, well, the task-based process, the way there was no limitations on it, so you could qualify someone for every task in their qual card without doing those other pieces. Um, post finding one, this is a training implementation matrix. This you go through a, a checklist and you look at everyone, what training they need. We found several boxes that were checked no, that should have been checked yes. That's what that came down to. Uh, training post two. Operator training programs not sufficiently comprehensive to cover all areas. This goes back to this, a similar thing to the other one except task based. We found a, a several qual cards that did not have the technical fundamentals they were required to have. Post three, this has to do with managers being hired and understanding the facility they're working at. The training requirements for them wasn't being well documented. That's what that came down to. What, you know. Phil leaves, someone else comes in, what training are they going to need? Waste acceptance. This, this was a very, very tricky one to evaluate because the safety analysis that was created had a lot of requirements that were new for how we're going to accept waste. And everyone, you know, we, you got to expect that. You know, we had an event where a drum came in that never should have been prepared the way it was prepared, and it got accepted by everyone and sent down into the underground. And so this is like, how are we going to keep that from ever happening again? So the waste acceptance area was a very big area. And the evaluator had to do this was perfect for the job because she has a nuclear safety background and a QA background. And she's extremely detail oriented, hence the, the pre-star findings. And as you'll see, the first one actually pertains to DOE. It's a DOE finding. It's not against NWP because DOE now has DSA controls that they have to implement. And the procedures they had were just were not sufficiently detailed to do the job per the safety basis. The, the pre second pre start is similar to the first one, except this was against NWP. They actually did have the procedure done, but it just lacked the detail that it required to implement all of Chapter 18. The third one has to do with the waste that's currently in the building. If you're going to put hold tags on it, which they've done, so they didn't inadvertently put it into the lift and send it to the underground, there's other requirements that go along with the internal procedure that NWP has. And you so say you didn't implement the other requirements, such as putting yellow tape around the containers to make it much more visible. So it doesn't seem like a big deal, but that's what the procedure required. Uh, the last one had to do with the, the WDS, which is called the Waste Data System. That's a software database that if you're building a payload out of the site, you go in there, you're putting everything into that system, what you're putting into each drum, you're tracking it. The problem was that software was not graded as safety software, and it should be. The last thing is Department of Energy. And there were six post starts here. Uh, the first one was relatively minor. That's why it was a post start. The person that's in the uh, that's overseeing the training program on the DOE side is not in their technical qual program, and they should be. The second one had to do facility reps in their what we call the occurrence reporting system. They're supposed to go in periodically whenever there's a reportable event. A reportable event is something that DOE headquarters wants to know about, and the fact reps are supposed to go in and look at what the contractors prepared and approve it, and they've not been doing it in the time frames required. The third one has to do with what they call their, their ICE system, issues collection and evaluation. They were putting surveillances in there, and they were languishing. No one was approving them. The fourth one, which is DOE 2 post 3, has to do with not having a tracking system for all your commitments. Those are things coming in from the contract that you need to approve. It could become things coming in from headquarters that you need to take action on. They weren't tracking those things to closure. 
the fourth one has to do back, this is more global on their ICE system, where a number of ICE issues are being developed, but no one's ensuring they actually get closed out. The last one is against my organization, DOE headquarters, in that we had a number of judgments in need that we were required to close out, and not all of them have been closed at this point. And this goes over some more stuff with respect to DOE, basically saying they've got a lot of programs in place, but they still need to improve. Now, where do you go from here? What we concluded was, yes, we have found 21 findings that were pre-start. We found 15 that were post-start. But when we looked at this, we said, we didn't really see anything we call a, quote, a showstopper. The programs were in place that needed to be in place. Obviously, there's areas that need to improvement. There's things they missed here and there that they need to correct. But so where do we go? Well, you go back to our DOE order, and it tells us what we have to do. It defines how the corrective action plans have to be done. And when you see the term SAA, that's Startup Authorization Authority, that's the person I give the report to, I give my findings to, with a recommendation for what we think they need to do to proceed. And so here was our list of recommendations to the Startup Authorization Authority. First was, we think once the pre-start findings are closed, along with the manageable list of pre-start, there were several things that were acknowledged as not ready when we showed up. That's the manageable list. Said, hey, we got a manageable list. These aren't ready yet, we know that. We came in identified a few more. And then on top of that, we said we also want to approve the post-start finding corrective action plan as well. So you do all that, we think they're good to go. And once those are all verified as closed, they're good to go, except post-starts don't have to be verified at that point. The other recommendation had to do with who should do what. Uh, we offered up the ORR team because we know the findings better than anyone. We said, we're willing to help your staff, Todd, close these things out, look at the caps, make sure they're adequate, make sure they'll prevent recurrence. Um, we also recommended that CBFL consider looking at some of their short-term needs for supplementing their staff to provide some oversight over the initial startup of operations. And the last bullet under there pertained to the, the DOE caps, where, you know, who's going to look at DOE caps? The folks that I had on my team were very independent. As I said, I, I had no one from even the state of New Mexico on my team, just to ensure we were very independent. So that's all those recommendations. Then we had a couple just with respect to ground control, because right before we showed up is when they had that roof fall in room four, panel seven. And so the recommendation was that, you know, once you get this report from MSHA, you need to take a very close look at it and make sure that you come up with a plan for addressing their concerns. And the second one was, you know, having an overall strategy for how you're gonna balance all these things. You gotta do ground control, you gotta do waste and placement. You know, the, the, you know, limited ventilation, limited resources, and come up with an overall strategy to handle that. And that's all I have. I'll turn it over to Phil. If you think it was fun to listen to, you should have lived it in color. I. Uh, glad to be here tonight to talk with you all. Uh, I've, I've re really got a dark screen. Okay, super. Uh, so uh, I'm really going to talk about five things with you tonight. First is uh, uh, kind of the status of uh, uh, in the underground, and that'll include uh, bolting progress in panel seven. So we'll talk, talk specifically about where we're going to put waste and its current current uh, status. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some of the uh, DOE pre-starts. Uh, you've already heard about those in, in detail. I'm going to talk about a little more about the process that we've gone through and how we've identified corrective actions. Uh, and where we stand relative to those. Uh, we're going to talk uh, about panel seven and the waste and placement se sequence, okay? As we get ready to put waste into panel seven, how does that work? How, how will we go through that? And lastly, just a little bit more on uh, the N NMED review and approval. And I'm assuming this is going to work this time, you bet. All right, so uh, relative to status in, uh, in panel seven, 
uh, where we've been working in panel seven now for really a few months. Uh, and I got to tell you, over the last couple months, we've made uh, exceptional progress uh, relative to bolting. And I think deep down the American people know that. The American people like their bullshit out front where they can get a good strong whiff of it. <laughs> are completely full of shit. Just the worst kind of people you could ever want to run into. That's when you get the big smile. Businessman always has that big smile on his face. The media are almost literally exploding with bullshit. Each week we're to put in something on the order uh, between 110 and 150 bolts each week uh, over uh, each week over the last uh, two months we've been putting in uh, over 300 bolts uh, and we reached a high in, in one week of th uh, 367 so uh, we've that took that's taken a lot of corrective actions a lot of improvement actions to streamline that process but but more than anything it's the dedication of the of the crews and the motivation of them to really uh, get get the get the ground in panel seven recovered. They've done an excellent job, and I can tell you that uh, rooms one, two, three, and five now uh, we consider to be stabilized. I'm going to show you uh, what that means at this point, but but what it really means is we don't expect groundfall uh, in any of those areas. Um, we're currently working uh, in the inlet and outlet drifts uh, to ensure that those areas are stabilized also, uh, and we think we've got a good handle on this at this point. Uh, this next slide here shows an animation uh, that's going to show you the progress that's been made over the last, uh, since uh, November 14th. Um, and, and as this changes, you can see more areas are changing from red to, uh, to green um, as this progresses through over that about six-week period. So we made it through uh, room, room two. Uh, then we started working in room three, uh, made our way through room three. Uh, as of December 12th, uh, there was just one very small section there, and I can tell you that that's now been complete. Um, that since those two rooms are done, then that's when they moved into the uh, the teams moved into the inlet and outlet drift and are now working uh, out now working there. So great progress uh, relative to uh, ground control in panel seven. I wanted to talk a little bit about corrective actions, and I wanted to go into a little bit more detail uh, in uh, how you go about dealing with those those findings. Um, and if I if you pay attention to the first column there, uh, these are the steps that I want to talk about. So initially, we have findings that are identified, and there were 21 as uh, Ed that were pre-start uh, that Ed talked about. Uh, those are findings. Um, then the first step to dealing with that is to put together a formal corrective action plan. And that includes developing a, a uh, apparent cause analysis. It's nice to know what caused something to not work the way you expected it so that you can go through that and then, and then fix that. So that's all part of the corrective action plan. Uh, in that corrective action plan, there will be corrective actions that are identified. Some of the findings really only required one corrective action. Others may have required uh, eight or ten corrective actions. So we identify all of those corrective actions plans. Uh, we did that. NWP is responsible for doing that initial development of the, uh, of the corrective action plan. We did that uh, on actually a Saturday and Sunday uh, following uh, the report out uh, from Ed's team. Once the corrective action plans are, are developed and documented, uh, then we begin working them, but in, in conjunction with that, uh, DOE has to validate that, that they agree that that corrective action plan, that that cause analysis, that those are the right actions and that those uh, are acceptable and will solve the problem. Uh, so that's done via CBFO and, uh, and Ed's team. They both play a role in reviewing those corrective action plans to make sure they're, they're correct. When the actions are completed, 
uh, we actually collect objective evidence, uh, objective evidence of completion of each of the actions, and we collect those in binders. Uh, and once we believe the action is, is done, uh, we then present that material to both representatives from Ed's team and, and CBFO. Uh, and they have to end up, uh, they ask questions, they have to review the material as presented, they may have to go out in the field to field validate uh, that action, they may go interview people to ensure that it's done right. Uh, once they have agreed that that corrective action is indeed closed, then they sign off, uh, and then once they believe, once they agree that all of the corrective actions for that finding are closed, then they, they validate closure of that particular finding, that that, and, and that one is complete. Now, that's the process. So, so as you can see, we've made a lot of progress as we've gone. If you look at the pre-start items, there were 21 findings. Uh, all of the corrective action plans have been developed. 17 of the 21 have been uh, approved by DOE. Uh, those those uh, uh, corrective action plans identified 83 associated actions that needed to be done in order to uh, close those findings. Um, the actions of those 83, 61 actions are complete as of today, field complete. Uh, and uh, the actions that have been doubt validated so far are six. Uh, six of those have been validated by DOE. That's actually six findings, to be quite honest with you. It's a little bit misleading. The label is misleading. Uh, six uh, out of 21 of the findings have been closed and validated, closed by DOE. Uh, as of when we put this table together. Uh, that, uh, and we're making good progress on those. As you could imagine, there's a, a, all of these actions and all of these findings are being worked on concurrently. And so we, we are, it's our hope that we see significant progress with that uh, and that we expect to get those closed over the next few days. Thought we'd show you a little bit uh, about Panel uh, seven and, and and what's going to happen in panel seven? Uh, panel panel seven is shown in the middle uh, there. With uh, six rooms are labeled, starting with room one at the top, moving all the way down to room six. Uh, you see, two of the rooms uh, are red. Those are prohibited areas. That's room four and room six. That means those areas. Uh, are closed, essentially. People don't go into those areas. They're not going to be used for waste and placement. Uh, the first area for waste and placement, is there a uh, laser on this? I'm afraid to push a button. I don't know what it is. Okay, uh, down uh, on uh, the right side of room six, in that small blue area, that is the f area where first waste emplacement will go. Uh, the, once we fill that particular area, we will then go to the area that makes up room five, which uh, is a U-shaped area that goes all the way past room four. That's the second area that will be filled. Then it will go into room three, the green area, uh, room two, the, the darker blue area, and then finally the light blue area at room one. That will be the fill sequence. Uh, that fill will take place at the rates that we project. We will fill that panel in something on the order between two and a half and three years uh, is uh, how long we project that to, uh, to take. So that, that's the sequence in the first area where wa waste emplacement will occur is the area right outside room six. Uh, the last thing that I was going to talk about was the NMD, NMED review. Uh, we had uh, a team of, of six folks came in uh, last week. They were here for a week, came in on Monday, uh, reported it out on Friday. Uh, it was a very thorough review again, very professional review. They also, uh, much the same as the DOE ORR, came in with a written plan of what they wanted to look at. Uh, we had pulled together hundreds of documents for them to review also uh, prior, to their, uh, prior to their visit. Uh, and, and they actually left with many of those documents still reviewing them. Uh, they per performed a very thorough inspection above ground and below ground, uh, looking at, at all of the areas that they were interested in. 
Um, the out brief was uh, well well done. Uh, we uh, they found some areas for us to improve, but overall they told us that they were very satisfied with what they had seen and comp they were very complimentary of the progress that they saw. Uh, we really uh, are are looking forward to their final report. Uh, and because we need their authorization, obviously, to uh, proceed with uh, waste and placement. We expect to get that shortly. Okay, Todd. So, again, I'll just uh, emphasize, you know, our path forward. The, uh, I think we've, you know, we said it and you've heard it in detail here. Uh, we have to work hard to get through the uh, validation of the actions by design. The the last step in the process is actually a DOE action uh, to verify the contract activities. We are working extremely hard. In fact, we're working seven days a week right now uh, to get there. Um, and uh, again, we're uh, it, it's getting close, and we're really, really just. Uh, I, I think Phil and myself uh, can't emphasize enough how hard and how professional the workforce has been to get us this point, and frankly, how dedicated they are uh, to get us here. And so, uh, certainly, very pleased for that. And that, John, I think we'll turn it over to uh, questions. Okay, we'll, we'll take questions like we have in the past. We'll begin in the room, and then after we've uh, answered the questions here, then we'll go to the online questions. So does anybody have a comment? Ed, thank you once again for being here. What a very comprehensive review. Uh, I think everybody understands maybe how complicated it is and not as simple as one might think. One might think that there's a lot involved. And as I said before, the training really that's going on now is like the training you would expect an airline pilot to have for, for every employee. It's and they are the same for people that are working in a nuclear power plant where they're on on duty for five weeks and then they're in uh, a simulator for five weeks. I mean, that's sort of how the system works and a much, much different uh, situation than it was prior to the incident happening without question. Completely different. So any any questions? Mary, thank you. There's quite a bit of stuff there to study, but um, I have a question about all the things that have been happening in the mine, the ceiling falls, you know, the contamination uh, and the closing off of that whole side of the mine. Does that affect the air quality in the mine at all for the workers, any of these things, or all of them together? <laughs> the... Uh Air quality uh, requirements are, are, have always been met for our workers, and that, uh, there are requirements under MSHA for certain amounts of uh, volumetric air you have to have around the equipment. We have uh, instruments that we take both portable with us and uh, installed in the mine in the underground for uh, contamination control or VOC, looking for VOCs. So the air quality is um, um, equal to what they would have elsewhere. As far as what closing it off, it actually helps us. Uh, by closing off the southern end of the underground, we now uh, will avoid having to ventilate 60% of the formerly contaminated area. And so that itself certainly helps us. I don't know, uh, Phil, you want to add any more? That's a good answer. Yeah. I think you did your best to try to give us a warm and fuzzy feeling about uh, the status of WIP. Um, uh, just one initial um, quick uh, question and then some more, but uh, refresh my memory, please. Why is room four, panel seven, going to be closed or is closed? Uh, room four was where the, the ground fault took place, recall, about a month ago. Uh, we started to see, see acceleration. We prohibited that area. Uh, I, uh, which means we put up fences to keep people out of that area. Uh, and then uh, about a month after we took that action, we actually had the ground fall that was predicted. So you did an uh, assessment of how much it would cost or how much effort it would take yeah. to remediate it, get it ready for waste disposal versus just skipping it, so you plan right now to skip it, is that correct? The, the plan, uh, th that, that's a good question. Uh, that, uh, we have not done 
a detailed formal analysis of that. Right now, our path forward does not include recovery of that. However, you're right, it could be recovered. Um, and, uh, but, but right now, uh, our focus uh, is uh, doing emplacement in the, in the, in the uh, order that I showed you. Now, that decision could be re-looked at, though. Uh, if information starts to, if we start to do analysis or more information comes available and we decide that is the direction to go, there's time to make that decision. So you may skip it, but you don't yes. know yet for sure. Right now the plan is skip. And you remember it was 200 feet long and 7, 8 feet deep. Yeah, I know, but, uh, you know, right. But uh, my uh, more, my broader question or comments are um, you did a contractor ORR before you did this, you had actually, I think, two levels of ORR before this one, correct? That's correct. So um, you went through all of that, and then you came up with all these pre-start items, and I beg to differ with the definition of no showstopper. A pre-start item is a showstopper until it is validated. Um, so, um, and... Um, I find it amazing that that many pre-start items still came up after you ran it to th two screens beforehand. And especially what really bugs me is that you found four pre-start items in waste acceptance. That was the key to the radiological release. So after almost three years of work and two screens, you still had not identified four pre-start items in that area. I would consider that a significant fact, a highly significant fact. Um, so, and, and, um, so the other significant fact I think that really you should have put up there in boldface is after almost three years and all this ORR, you still have absolutely no overall mine strategy plan. That's utterly amazing. So I think that highlights really the fact that what we call a startup has been down-defined, or a restart or a recovery has been down-defined over the last three years into, let's get a few symbols of waste into this place, maybe before the end of this year, maybe early, early next year, and declare success. And the key questions that I have in that is, are there any kinds of bonuses to either CBFO or contractor personnel tied to getting waste into the place even in a rather insignificant amount by certain dates? To answer the last question for CBFO, no, there are no bonuses associated with uh, CBFO. I'll let Phil answer for NWP. But to, to answer a couple of those, issues. One of the things Ed stressed was the independence of the review. Um, by its very nature, each team that comes in uh, emphasizes a different area, looks at a different part of the program, and, and finds these. This is, uh, I, you know, Ed, Ed can certainly chime in on this, but this happens in every review that happens in DOE. The contractor has an MSA, they have findings. Contractor ORR will have findings, DOE will have findings. And so I don't think this was an atypical for any uh, particular facility around the complex. Um, we also, I think it was a, uh, a um, can be attributed to the fact that this was an extremely uh, deep dive. It was a broad dive. They looked at all 17 areas. They had uh, 20 members or 15 members. Um, and so I think that also contributed. And, and frankly, we welcome the findings. It, it only makes us stronger by seeing these and identifying these areas. Um, I don't know, Ed, if you want to further talk about that. Uh, you specifically mentioned the four issues in waste acceptance. And we agree, you know, waste acceptance is a big deal. And that's why, I, I mean, I went out of a way to find the very best person I could find to look at that. And to be honest, she did an amazing job. It's incredibly detailed and thorough. If you look back at what I was saying about the findings, well, first one was CBFO. They're, they had a procedure, just didn't meet our standards of what a procedure should be. And it's pretty obvious why. It's the first time we've ever had a DOE office with a DSA requirement. The contractor procedures, similarly, they had them in place, but they didn't meet our expectations because these are brand new requirements that are being in place for the basis of knowledge and for the enhanced compatibility analysis of the chemicals. So these are new things. 
you know, if you could say, you could look at these and say, well, you could, you could argue, are these really pre-start findings? We held the bar extremely high. Are almost literally exploding with bullshit. <laughs> because they're located right at the crossroads of all the other bullshit. These people are sitting right at bullshit junction. <laughs> There's enough bullshit in the media for Texas to open a branch office. And you still have enough left over to start two law firms and a Christian bookstore. Of burning and fire and smoke and... There were pre-starts. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd start with uh, the same thing that Todd started with. Uh, there, are, there are no bonuses, none, that are tied to the restart of WIP at a particular date. It doesn't, in fact, uh, I've been doing this for a long time and I've never seen a bonus, at least uh, in any of the companies that I've worked with, that have been tied to a specific activity done at a specific time. Uh, that's, a, that, that's, a, that's a bad, that would be a bad management practice and I've not seen it done and it certainly hasn't been done in this case. Um, you know, the number of findings uh, initially uh, bothered me. And, and in fact, at, at the out brief, I asked that, that, that because when you have a, no, a number of findings, you worry about it because of two things. Uh, the first would be um, the fact that you had that number of findings. Did it inhibit the team from actually seeing everything that they needed to see because they were so busy writing down findings? And his answer was no. We saw a deep dive. Uh, the, we did a deep dive, and we, we saw everything that we needed to see. The second thing that worried me about it is if you think about WIP and what we've been doing, uh, every activity, every hazard uh, that people are exposed to, uh, all scopes of work, uh, we have been doing for the last two years with one exception. We haven't moved drums. Uh, we have done ground control. We have worked in contaminated areas. We have done maintenance of, of, of equipment. And so my question was, for him was, uh, as a result of these findings, is there any indication that we are not safe to do the things that you know we are doing today? And his answer was unequivocal. I'll let him say it again. But it was no, none of this. Uh, uh, tells us that you shouldn't be doing the work that you're doing today. He will send you to a special place <laughs> of burning and fire and smoke and torture and anguish for you to live forever and suffer and burn and scream until the end of time. But he loves you. <laughs> Holy shit! Mr. Westbrook uh, mentioned at the beginning that the uh, scope, well, first of all, he emphasized that this was an independent review. I beg to differ with that a little bit if all the people were DOE people. But that's the internal definition that you have for independent. But you also mentioned that the scope was actually given by CBFO. Um, I know actually from personal experience that when you evaluate a project or a team that quite frequently uh, you, s you have a given <coughs> scope uh, but you see stuff that is outside the scope that may give you pause or give you some reason to maybe comment in addition to the constrained scopes that you were given. So my question is did you have an open mind to actually go beyond the scope? And if so, did you see anything maybe in a more global sense that gave you possibly some pause and did you make maybe some recommendations that went beyond the scope that, we were, that you were given originally? Yes. With, uh, with respect to ground control, the way the plan of action was, was given, 
our, our review of ground control was quite limited. It was basically to evaluate the ground control on the path that the waste would take into panel seven. And just to let you know, I had, a, I had four team members that had to go through the full gamut of training to be qualified. So that meant getting the mine safety training. They had to upgrade their radi radiological training for uh, Red Worker 2. They had to get mask fits, respirator training. And I had four of them qualified to go down into the mine and do different things in the contaminated area to look at those things. And they did that. And that was the limits of what we really had to do for ground control. And the reason was we already knew MSHA was, was coming in and doing their independent review. And as far as that goes, MSHA is not DOE. They're an independent agency. But when we started, we said, you know, we're looking at the ground control. We need to do a little more than what the plan of action specified. So we did go out and interview the uh, geotechnical engineers and ask what they were doing and how they were doing their job. Uh, we went and talked to some of the miners, some of the people down there, and how they were doing their job, specifically the ground control. So that was beyond what was in the original plan. And by the way, two of my team members were not DOE employees. So, correct. And just to I'll let Phil go a second, talking about scope, you know, when we talk about what was in scope and what wasn't in scope, um, it perhaps doesn't give the full story. I will tell you what was not in scope, remote handled waste. They didn't look at that. But the reason is we're not going to take remote handled waste anytime in the near future. Uh, another piece that was not in scope was the interim ventilation system. And the reason was that just went through a readiness activity um, six months ago. Other than that, just about, I can't think of any part of our operations that wasn't in scope. And they even looked at IBS a little bit too. Um, so, to, you know, the scope probably covered 98% of what we do on the site or something like that. And the only other thing I was going to comment on is, and I should have done it while I had it the first time, but uh, ground control program, uh, it's unfair to our people, the people that work so hard and have a 30-year track record of protecting uh, workers in that underground to say they don't have a, a ground control program plan. They do. Uh, there is a plan that exists, and we follow that plan. Uh, yeah. I, it's, it, it's what, what we're doing, what we're doing to improve that is it's, it's a very expert-based program right now. And it has been for all of these years, and, and, and it's been filled with experts, and they've done an outstanding job. What we want to try to do is start to trans transition that to a more standards-based program. Uh, it's what we, what we talked about with MSHA when they were here, and they liked the idea. Uh, we've we've uh, worked with some outside consultants that are helping us with that. Uh, and I think it's going to do nothing but improve our program and our process going forward. I view it as a, an important area for WIP to continue to improve in because it is the most significant hazard, frankly, that we have uh, in this mission. And, and we need to make sure we, 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 are, we want to be the best in the world when it comes to ground control. And we're trying to work ourselves that direction. Let, let me ask a question about, did, did you go to, as an example, Los Alamos and interview the CCP people? Did you go anywhere in the country and interview those folks that are doing the waste preparation? And, you know, that was, uh, you know, that's been a tremendous concern of mine that we just don't, I mean, how did they sign off on waste being delivered without ever uh, looking at the documentation, and so how, what, what have you done in that regard? Now, just, just to clarify, Todd went through some things that were out of scope, that was out of scope. When ours was being scoped, our particular review was, what can we do within the confines of Carlsbad? A separate review was being done to look at all the other sites that are waste generators. That's called an IRR, I believe. Readiness review? Yeah, and a GST. And the GSTR. So there's other reviews that are being done to cover all those. We looked at the portion that was done here as far as what the people here do for the waste acceptance when they receive the data. How are they doing their validation of it? And to be honest, the person, even though we wrote findings, they were very impressed 
with the people that are here that are doing that job. And these people are really, really sharp. And with the information that they're going to be getting now that they didn't get in the past, shouldn't happen. And I'll go on to say the, there is another readiness review. It's it's slightly different because it doesn't quite fit into our order. Um, but there is a independent review we will do of the national true program itself before we accept waste from uh, other sites. This review covered uh, what we have on site and emplacement of it. But there is still another review to come. Okay, what do you have online? Uh, yeah, Mr. Heaton, I have about 14 questions, and we may not get to all of those. I'm, gone through and we'll try to get the ones that are related to the topics. Uh, Mr. Schrader, you've got several questions related to the reopening date. I know you addressed that briefly, but uh, one of them is the goal still in placement of the first waste from the waste handling building before the end of December and what is your level of confidence? Uh, similar question, what's the ballpark for reopening? December doesn't seem realistic after Ed's presentation. Our goal, based on everything we know, continues to be December. And again, uh, safety is a priority, and doing it right is a priority for us. And if it takes a little bit uh, beyond that, uh, then we will take the time. But our goal still does remain uh, December. And you know, we are at the last steps of the readiness process. Thank you. Uh, another question. The WIP hazardous waste permit states that WIP's waste capacity is 6.2 million cubic feet. After the loss of much of panel one and partial loss of panel seven, what's your expected capacity now? The capacity requirement, the 6.2 million cubic feet, 175,000 cubic meters, I believe is what it uh, roughly translates to, is the uh, legislative volume under the Land Withdrawal Act. That number has not changed. It's still 175,000 cubic meters. Okay. Uh, next question, how will the new enhanced waste acceptance process Assure that independent reviews in the process are performed by people or companies not involved in their development. The uh, expanded reviews themselves have uh, a number of requirements for both uh, CCP uh, to do their work, but more importantly, uh, as Ed talked about, the DOE activities, the CBFO activities have been significantly expanded, and we're not associated with the companies. And, uh, you know, it, as he said, it led to a couple findings because we're doing work that is not done anywhere else in the complex, uh, uh, getting in and independently verifying the work. And so uh, it, it's the strengthened. CBFO activities, I think, will provide us the uh, additional oversight and additional assurances uh, that the waste acceptance criteria will be met. Okay. Uh, are the drums in the waste handling building approved for disposal in the underground per the new process? They are either uh, have been or they will be before we uh, finish it. I believe about two-thirds of them have gone completely through the process and are ready for disposal. Uh, and we're working through the last little bit now, but there's no reason to believe they're not going to get through the process either. Okay. When will the underground airflow maps be posted on the website showing how airflow is managed when waste emplacement starts? We can uh, look at that now. Now, keep in mind that uh, airflow is something that changes quite often. The uh, NWP has a very good program to direct air where we need it. Uh, you know, if we were doing a maintenance activity in an area or needed more diesel equipment, we would direct air there. So um, I think there could certainly be some general maps, but day to day that may change at any time. Uh, yeah, and it, actually, if you uh, if you go back to the the slide that I showed, that uh, yeah, that one. Okay, so the arrows the arrows on that that slide show where we they they go from where you start waste emplacement to where waste emplacement will end in that area. So this slide is meant to depict the pattern of waste emplacement. Airflow will be exactly in the opposite direction. Sure, if you go back again. So, so, so generally, airflows in 2520, it will then 
uh, go across the room from uh, from from my right to my left, and then we'll go out 2180. And that's the that that's the design and the pattern for uh, for every panel. Okay. I've got a couple questions about roof bolting. Um, one of them, panel seven, was being prepared to accept waste for at least a year. Did that include renewed bolting in the ceiling of room four that later experienced a cave in? And somewhat similar question, describe how ground control will be carried out in rooms while waste is being emplaced in these rooms and after waste has been emplaced. Yeah, our, our, uh, okay, so there's, there's two parts to that. Uh, we really talked about room four uh, already. R right now the plan in room four is it will stay prohibited and it won't receive waste. Um, relative to uh, emplacing waste in a room when waste is going in, that won't happen. Uh, we we intend to with the areas where waste emplacement will be conducted, all bolting in that particular area will be complete prior to doing waste emplacement in that area. Okay. Let me try to get one. Oh, Mr. Rampage. Before we run out of time, and since this is uh, probably the last town hall meeting and we haven't heard much about the status of other things, I got um, actually four other items I wanted to briefly uh, ask you about. Um, it's my understanding that you started the um, coring for the new shaft. Has that actually started? And if so, where roughly are you? Yeah, it, it it is it has started, but it's just in its early stages. Uh, so we don't actually have any out yet. With there's a pilot hole that actually is being conducted now, and we expect to actually get into core uh, drilling for the actual cores in January. So you haven't started with it yet. Yeah. Okay. Um, at the uh, last meeting of the uh, legislative uh, committee. Uh, meeting in Santa Fe on hazardous and uh, radioactive, uh, radioactive materials, um, Dr. Hardy indicated that uh, CMERC uh, put together a paper to be presented at Waste Management nine, uh, 2017 that uh, basically makes a point that WIP is clean enough that you could run it without filtration, My uh, or the underground at least. Uh, my question there is, did um, CMERC share that paper with uh, CBFO, DOE, et cetera? And what are the current consequences or reactions to that paper? You sent the paper to I, not yet, or where do we stand on that? So it hasn't been shared with DOE yet? Okay. Um, at a previous meeting um, several months ago, I actually asked that you, um, that DOE, CBFO, give us at each meeting a running tab on the cost of recovery, and that has not been done since then. Uh, one number I heard at one time is that recovery so far for the almost three years since the incident has been on the order of a quarter billion dollars. Are we still roughly there, and would you please take an action item to maybe make that a standing item on the agenda of future town hall meetings? We can certainly do that, yes. The number uh, is about that, uh, plus uh, permanent ventilation system will be counted against that in the future, and that's about the same amount also in that range. Okay, if you could give us maybe a better breakdown in future sure. meetings, especially maybe split up uh, how much of the recovery costs so far can be attributed to the um, to the fire and how much to the radiological event. I'm sure you've got cost account numbers that can split that up and that you can pass that information on to us. But the fourth question is, uh, you lost two significant uh, members of the CBFO team during the last few months. One is Abe Van Luke and the other one is Roger Nelson. Abe was responsible for international cooperation. There has been no international re review of anything at WIP for probably at least 10, 15 years. Uh, and there has been probably nothing happening since uh, Abe passed away. And Roger Nelson, of course, was a science uh, advisor, chief scientist to the CBFO. Uh, what, if anything, is being done to replace those two individuals? For, on the international front, uh, 
that duty is assigned to someone else in CBFO, and we actually continue our, uh, our uh, discussions and relationships with various international organizations. Uh, for instance, EDRAM, um, I've, I've continued to talk with them. We had personnel uh, from the WIP project as a whole in Paris over the last couple weeks, or I'm sorry, last few months uh, at a couple of NEA and OECD uh, conferences. So we do maintain our international uh, contacts right now. Uh, as far as the chief scientist role, it is uh, uh, we are looking to replace that. We're working through the uh, hiring process. As you can imagine, that's a somewhat specialized role uh, and uh, uh, specialized skills associated with it. Um, but we uh, intend to, uh, at some point in the future, uh, reconstitute that role, uh, reconstitute that role. Uh, we will also, uh, I suspect, after we get started, uh, probably be able to increase our, our uh, associations with our international partners a little bit more. As you can imagine, we're somewhat focused on restart right now. So. Okay. Okay. I, I, I have some more. Why don't we take two more? So, yeah. go. Okay. Um, when do you plan to install the eight explosion isolation walls in panels three, three through six as specified in WIPS hazardous waste permit? There's a, um, uh, a permit modification in right now with NMED to uh, address the issues of how to close the panels uh, three, four, five, and six, and how and the south end of the underground, and that's being reviewed. Okay. Uh, what's the plan to fix the barrels at WCS so they can return? Do you plan to emplace waste containers in room six and panel? Do you plan to bring those? What's your plan for the WCS barrels? Uh, for WCS, LANO, Los Alamos National Lab has the lead for any treatment of those activities. Uh, the relationship to us is they have to meet our waste acceptance criteria. Uh, when they're treated to that point, they can be shipped to WIP. I was reading about LANO, and they have a plan on treating theirs. They're not going to start it till the spring. And they're going to add water in inert materials, supposedly. Oh, no, DOE was going to suggest that, and Lannell said that they will be cooled and depressurized. So we've got three or four things going on there with them. I don't know what's going to happen with them, and I don't think anybody else seems to have it straightened out either. Uh, uh, Los Alamos uh, has the lead for that, and I'm, I don't think any of us have looked in detail recently, uh, you know, our position is you have to meet our waste acceptance criteria before you ship it to us, and how they get there is their responsibility. But you have an oversight person at Lano. Uh, we do. Yes. We do. That uh, is the person that suggested this, adding water and inert material. Uh, that could be one treatment method you, uh, you could take. I don't know what their final plan is, though, yet. Uh, just to follow on the latest item here, um, I think it's sort of disingenuous that the local CBFO chief is saying that's not really my bailiwick, that's up to Los Alamos, because from evidence that I found on the internet, and these are the original documents, um, DOE, Marcinowski specifically, signed off on the original decision to... Um, ship that waste from Los Alamos to WCS and there were at the time both CBFO and NW people involved including the previous general manager of NWP. So uh, DOE is also the landlord and the owner of all the national labs so let me ask this that in future meetings, town hall meetings, maybe the whatever highest DOE representative who is present has also a status on what is the situation with WCS and that Los Alamos waste and what Los Alamos is doing because anything else in this community is being going to be perceived as rather disingenuous. And in that context, actually, that was interim storage that we have right now in effect at WCS that was blindly gone into at the time against the advice of several people at the time. And now, of course, we have before the NMED the permit modification request for another interim storage, this one at the WIP site. And uh, so I have seen no evidence that there have been any lessons learned from the first screw-up 
before we now go for another interim storage. And I think it's highly, um, well, risky, I think, to proceed to another interim storage project when the lessons haven't even been learned from the first mistake yet. So in that context, though, I'm wondering, uh, the, um, I think DOE requested recently to extend the comment period on that permit modification for the NMED. Uh, these announcements are usually just bureaucratic minimum. Would please anyone elaborate on what was exactly the reason why you requested that extension? The extension was granted because, frankly, we uh, it was feedback from the uh, uh, stakeholders that requested more time, and we felt that was appropriate. Uh, now, NMED is the one who actually extends the comment period. The department doesn't. They are the lead. But uh, we certainly agreed that uh, because it was new and because there was an extensive, extensive stakeholder uh, interest that it was prudent to extend the comment period. Uh, and we can also take an action item uh, to talk about laying on drums again here in the future. If you remember, Doug Hensey was down here, I don't know, about May, April, about six months ago. Um, so certainly we can, um, we can take action uh, when they're further along. How many more? That's it? Okay. Any other questions again? So, hearing none, uh, thank you once again, everyone, for being here and uh, for all the presentations. Ed, thank you for your very comprehensive review. Six out of 21 completed. Long way to go, maybe, but uh, hope, hopefully, hopefully soon. Uh, but uh, again, thank you, those of you that are online. We appreciate your attendance, and everybody have a good evening and happy holidays.